for, for today's talk, kind of, or the inspiration, my thinking, stems from a lot of the debates that are heightened, especially in our current times, around the question of what kind of alternatives, what kind of alternative economies, what kind of alternative societies, what kind of alternative values do we want to, do we desire to, or should we move towards? And um, within these debates, care and caring, care work, kind of iterations of it, have become some kind of a buzzword. And not only from kind of the more radical, let's say, wings of this debate, but also kind of mainstream. So a sustainable and caring economy is an important means to meet the goal of sustainable development. This is the World Economic Forum that is kind of emphasizing care. Uh, bringing care and the economy together, again, this is from World Bank. But the last one, recentering of communities around the reproductive economy of care, that's the degrowth people. So there's kind of this, there's this like a lot of emphasis, a lot of like talk about care, but not really like clear what we're talking about. And I take these debates seriously and I take care and care work seriously. But um, within this kind of buzz, within this cloud, a lot of the important questions that I take seriously are kind of lost and, and are left un unanswered. So how do we make care the basis of an economy, of a different economy, of a post-growth, post-capitalist economy? What does it mean to make care the basis of an economy? How do we revalue care? How do we recenter our economies around care? How do we understand value and productivity in an economy that is recentered around care? Um, how do we change our values towards care or is changing our values enough? So before, kind of, I mean, I don't have answers obviously for these questions, but like I think maybe this conversation uh, might kind of trigger us, might inspire us to think uh, about them more or more critically or more radically. But um, I want to kind of take a step back about what care is and, and what care work is. And I'm going to kind of draw a little bit about the tradition in feminist economics on, on what care is, what care work is, and how it's been taken up. So the most straightforward but kind of admittedly narrow definition of care work is that it's labor, perfor labor performed to fulfill the needs of those who cannot fulfill them themselves, such as food provision, cleaning, health care, or child care. So there's a lot of, like, there's a long tradition of feminist activism as well as scholarship that has problematized care work and kind of highlighted that it's gendered and it's highly invisible and it's flexible. So care work is often performed by women as unpaid labor under patriarchal relations. Gender norms and gender division of labor usually makes it hard for women to bargain away, to get out of these care responsibilities. Women rarely, or care workers in general, rarely have control over the timing, the amount, or the conditions of care work that they do. And even when care work is provided through the state or the market, it's usually still highly feminized. So it's usually women who perform this kind of labor. One kind of aspect of care work that has been kind of discussed by feminist economics, ec economists in, in particular, is that care work is differentiated, it's distinct from other kinds of social reproductive work, particularly because of the motivation behind it. So there's kind of this, this component, this emotional affective component uh, that, re that refers to the quality of the relationship between the caregiver and the care receiver that determines then the quality of the care itself. So there's kind of this, this reference to the motivation of care work which I think is true and might be true in many contexts, but kind of understanding the emotional or the affective component of care as caring for, as kind of this altruism, this feeling, uh, is risky. And, and kind of this assuming and, and unquestioned altruism in care work is risky, mostly because it risks naturalizing this link between the authentic feelings of women and the quality of care that they give. So the problem more broadly with understanding care as a particular emotion or a particular quality of relationships or an innate characteristic or a form of altruism is that it bears a danger of pinning care on, this is, a, this is 
something I made up, so I don't know. <laughs> Pinning it on um, either a specific group of people, women, for instance, or a specific form of subjectivity, or the existence of a specific value. So it means that we are, first of all, implicitly, if we are kind of holding on to this concept of, of our understanding of care as kind of a feeling or an emotion or a pre-existing quality, that we are implicitly delegating the kind of labor that care involves to a group of people who are assumed to hold that value or hold that subjectivity, which is pretty kind of unfair, right? Secondly, that it means that we do not recognize and therefore fail to support variety of forms of relationships, labor and practices that can involve types of care that do not necessarily fit into this kind of um, genuine emotion or devotion. And perhaps, and this is something that is discussed less um, and maybe more important for today's panel is that this view of care, kind of an essentialized view of care or caring, um, it tends to ca cast care as a pre-given static quality rather than opening space to ask how care and caring can emerge and can be produced. So if we are going to move towards an alternative, how can we produce care or how can we produce caring? How can we support caring? So this type of pinning care on therefore can lead kind of caricaturistically a search, so to speak, where care is and where caring subjects are, finding them and sort of expecting them to do the work that we should be doing, kind of to do the work of getting us out of this mess, uh, rather than actually transforming ourselves towards care, whatever that means. I know it's kind of, <laughs> I'm telling you what care isn't. <laughs> um, so doing this uh, rather than transforming ourselves, our economies and our societies. So the question I wanna ask today, and I want you to ask with me, and kind of maybe if you have an answer, tell me, how to understand care and caring economies beyond essentializing narratives of femininity, beyond reproducing gender binaries and without ascribing certain feelings or qualities to women? How do we understand caring for nature or caring for the commons this way? And how do we radicalize the potential that care holds and implies and how do we mobilize it towards organizing ourselves and organizing our economies? So what I'm going to kind of propose is a different, a broader understanding of care, something that's more useful, I think, to imagine politically and radically about transformation, more as something that pertains to how we organize ourselves. I like to propose to think about care as a as not as a quality of altruism or, or a genuine emotion, but rather a recognition and negotiation of interdependence. Interdependence socially, so among humans, but interdependence with non-human nature too. So this is, what, this is close to what Gibson Graham, and I think it's a name that's familiar to at least some of you in the audience. I've heard this name throughout the conference. Gibson Graham refers to when they talk about enabling ethical economies and when they refer to nodes of ethical decision making. For Gibson Graham, community economies open up space, open different dimensions of interdependence to ethical negotiation on an everyday basis, what they call surviving well together. So for Gibson Graham and the broader community economies collective, for instance, the shared work of building a community economy is care work. It involves actively recognizing and identifying diverse ways of being and managing our being in common and our interdependence ethically. I will, however, go ahead and add a few other things to recognition and, and negotiation um, namely responsibility, respect, and justice. So it's not only a matter of recognizing interdependence, I think it's being recognized in different ways, but not necessarily in a respectful, responsible, or just way. So a few other things about kind of this, this idea of, of care as recognizing and negotiating interdependence is that this also means that we move, move beyond a notion of substantial individual and focus on the fact and or maybe realize the fact that we are all processes of becoming. 
And in that sense that we see that care work itself produces different ways of being, different types of social relationships, different types of networks and different collective subjectivities. And also I think allows us to see care, caring or caring relationships, not as things that are pre-given, but rather things that are becoming, that are produced. Then the question becomes, how do we build institutions, structures, or more broadly spaces that produce care as recognition and negotiation of interdependence responsibly, respectfully, and justly? So that very speculative and inevitably incomplete answer I'm going to throw out is um, what I call commoning as radical care work rather than caring for the commons. So commons, as you know, is, is, is also kind of a buzzword and it's being used very widely and, and is being invoked by a variety of positions and, and being used in a variety of frameworks. <coughs> but I would like to today draw upon, and, and I do kind of in my own work, um, I'll do it, like use this tradition, the tradition of autonomous Marxist uh, understanding of, of commons, but more specifically commoning. Some of the names that are affiliated with this tradition are George Papantis, Silvia Federici, Massimo De Angelis, or the Midnight Notes Collective. So this understanding, this kind of approach, um, emphasizes that commons are not only fixed entities between, kind of sitting between the market and the state, but rather an amalgam of social relations and practices and struggles. Um, so kind of the first thing is that it's not a fixed kind of approach or not, doesn't see the commons as a fixed um, kind of entity. But this perspective conceptualizes commons as non-commodified modes of social reproduction of accessing resources and fulfilling social needs that provide various degrees of protection both from the market and the state. So this perspective also stresses the particular characteristics of the social practices that constitute commons or commoning practices. That commons should be open to all who contribute to their reproduction. They're sustained and sub reproduced by collective and cooperative labor. They're regulated non-hierarchically and democratically. More specifically than commons are defined in this framework as spaces and processes of social reproduction that are not mediated by the state or the market and ensure equitable access to all who contribute them. Their reproduction and production take place under collective labor. They provide equal access to the means of reproduction and they're marked by egalitarian forms of decision making. So this approach kind of one, I think, strength of this approach or seeing commons and commoning this way is that it incorporates the specific values and kind of principles around these social practices, around commoning practices, such as solidarity, collectivity, cooperation, self-governance, egalitarianism, democracy. But it also reveals forms of relationships between human communities and the commons uh, that are not limited to kind of utilitarian extraction of benefits, such as being self-sufficient, being careful of environmental reproduction, autonomous social reproduction, guaranteeing subsistence rather than profit making or production for the market. So there are a variety of principles um, and values that is highlighted by this framework. When seen in this light, there are many forms of commons around us that are not necessarily kind of traditional, physical, natural commons, such as the urban gardens, land spots, urban spots, food co-ops, local currencies. These are all practices in self-provisioning that are outside of the market and the state, and they embody a collective form and, they, and to varying degrees kind of democratic and egalitarian form of self-provisioning. Urban and rural land occupations, for instance, are commoning practices to the extent that they provide collective access to the means of social reproduction, such as shelter and arable land, and um, outside of the market, and represent non-commodified forms of collectively governed wealth. Urban community gardens, likewise, can serve as vehicles of regaining control over food production, provision for subsistence, and regeneration of the environment. Kind of going back to commoning as radical care, these examples, or kind of commoning forms, 
they am the principles they embody are towards recognizing interdependence and negotiating it respectfully, responsibly, and justly. So I'd say a commoning work is radical care work. <coughs> but beyond kind of commoning being uh, all around us or commoning being radical care work, commons actually, the important aspect of commoning as radical care work is that they potentiate and empower struggles against capital and the state by virtue of providing degrees of autonomy, degrees of autonomy in social reproduction. In that sense, they provide the very basis, the very material basis of struggle, the disentanglement of the means and processes of social reproduction from the market and the state provide kind of the independence that political subjects need in countering both. If, if for instance, commoning practices around food, housing, water, health, can provide such a space, such a material base of autonomy, the necessity to rely on capital or the state for social reproduction would effectively be loosened. So we'd be freer, <coughs> we'd rely on, on, on our employer less, we'd rely on the state less, so we'd have more power to fight against them. The subjects of struggles against capital and state would gain an upper hand if and when these material bases of social reproduction commons are organized and equip these subjects with autonomy. So this similar argument, I think, applies. I mean, this argument applies for the politics of recentering our economies around care or the politics of commoning or the politics of any kind of radical transformation. We need to organize the material basis of our survival relatively autonomous from the powers that threaten that survival in order to be able to counter them. Thank you. Um, why don't we go to the other one? Thank you so much, Bengi. Amazing. Our second speaker is Joe Mancini. He's a co-founder of the Working Center, which was formed in 1982 here in Kitchener, or near, nearby Kitchener, in response to unemployment and poverty in the downtown area of the city. To this day, the Working Center gives people access to tools to create their own work, such as access to technology, housing, and job resources. Joe, thank you, and welcome. Thank you. Well, so much, um, you know, the Working Center um, can sometimes be seen as a social service, but it can also be seen as um, the kind of dis definition that Bengi was just using as a commoning kind of entity. Um, an entity that's um, rooted itself over 37 years, and it's kind of, it's beyond what you might think in terms, of, in terms of what the potential is to create these common kinds of spaces, places. Um, so the, the Working Center starts out as a volunteer-inspired venture that seeks to give access to tools and opportunities to build community. So again, we didn't start with a social service definition. We started with a tools definition. Um, what I'm going to do today, I think, Let's see where we go here. So, you know, just to give you a little, the broadness of the Working Center, started in 1982, there's 35 plus projects. We own uh, without mortgage and have renovated ourselves 12 commercial buildings and houses, 60 plus residents uh, in support of housing. And, um, you know, we've hardly had any government money to do, purchase these buildings and do this work. I mean, we have little bits of government money, but, there's never been a purposeful grant, hardly a purposeful grant for housing, for example. It's, it's been the result of our work by buying these buildings and, and turning the upstairs into apartments and such. 1,500 people a day walk through working center projects, 150 plus workers, uh, plus 500 volunteers. Um, what's key about the working center is that it's organized around relationships. And relationships, uh, that are structured to replace power. 
And uh, there's six kinds of things. I'm going to just go through them quickly, and then they should become apparent through the slides. Um, one is that we're an oral culture. We don't have job descriptions. We don't have a written strategic plan. We don't paste rules in our spaces. Um, it's all about relationships. It's about talking to people. Um, we resolve things through, like that's oral culture, is resolving things together through talking. Um, another idea is that um, we bring in the virtues. I, don't, I can't see if the fellow from Italy is here. Maybe he didn't come back. Uh, he gave a presentation just that I was at, and he was, he was um, kind of going towards the idea that we need to go back to the cynics, and uh, with cynics being a, a philosophy around, really around virtue. And uh, so it's kind of funny. I wish he was here, because we'll, we'll, I'll describe what these virtues are and how we've kind of integrated them into a structure um, in a way that the cynics would approve. Um, our way of operating is called common tables. And so each project, all these 35 projects have common tables. And then there's an overall common table um, that draws from these projects. Um, it's a non-hierarchical structure. Um, it's really a distributive web. Uh, and I'll show you some of that. Um, the most amazing thing about the Working Center is that we have an equal salary policy. So a cafe worker who would start uh, could make the director's wage, which is my wage, after about 10 years. So, so basically, um, you know, our wages start around 30,000, and my wage is capped at 40,000. It's a very big organization, but we have um, um, coordinators who take ownership for this work of serving community. And so it's not about the money that we make, it's about the community that we develop. Um, a, um, a real important part of the Working Center is that we're decentralized but integrated. It's a service model. So, you know, we do have a board, we have, a, you know, we have ac accounting sections and an IT section and a bookkeeping section, maintenance and construction, job cafe for labor, um, a main common table. These, these kinds of structures are services to the projects. So rather than, in most organizations, services use their, um, s their strength as power to, to, um, to force these projects into the conception that they have. And the Working Center tries to grow from the bottom up, listening to what people are saying, and then build from there. And, you know, whatever, forever, whatever you want to say about it, it actually works. Um, so I'm going to start showing you some of what it starts to look like. Um, so an inter interconnected community, a job search resource center, access to technology, community tools. We have a school, uh, St. John's Kitchen. Uh, and we've done a lot of downtown revitalization. Um, so, you know, you get something like job search, and it, and it does build out. And there's a lot, like, it's interesting for the working center. Job search is really important, the job search resource center, because that's where people are at. People need income. And so creating a wide-ranging resource that's very interconnected, that helps people, is really important. So about 3,000 people a year use our, our resources in this area. Um, you know, and that's imp kind of employment support and work opportunity and supportive learning. Um, so, uh, so I'm going through these really quickly. Um, so then you get to philosophy. Um, underneath the working center. People need not only to obtain things, they need above all the freedom to make things among which they can live, to give shape to them according to their own taste, to put them to use in care for and about others. And you know, I, I think what Benji was saying is exactly what Ivan Illich was saying in Tools for Conviviality back in 1970. And, and we need to learn it. We need to understand um, its possibilities. And so a lot of the working center takes takes a lot of, uh, of its ideas from Illich. And we started um, doing our own art that describes, you know, what the tools for conviviality look like. So these, this is just kind of an introduction to these projects that we call community tools. Some of them are pretty decent enterprises, um, substantial enterprises, cafes and thrift stores and bike shops and two-acre market gardens. Um, but it, it grows out 
um, with all kinds of more services that you can offer the community, and it's unending. This is, this is a small sample of the potential that, that uh, community groups can do if they decentralize and you harness their internal resources, not on high wages at the top, but on services at the bottom. And so these are community enterprise, I don't know. That's our bike shop. Um, you know, I guess if I went backwards to say, uh, let's go. The um, community, uh, that's our thrift store. You know, we move 2,500 items a week. The bike, oh, this is gonna go too fast. <laughs> the bike shop, you know, 5,000 bikes get fixed a year at um, Recycle Cycles. Um, you know, commercial kitchen where, if I could describe it, it would be great. You know, 300 <laughs> people are, you know, use our, go to our cafe each day. <laughs> IT infrastructure, a, a thrift store that's really a, a nice thrift store. <laughs> Fresh ground, which is all about uh, plant-based eating. A common studio for filmmaking. Screening, that's our two acre market garden. It looks really beautiful. Uh, we produce about 22,000 units of food out of that. Plus we have a greenhouse that we built ourselves. We grow microgreens that we sell. And lots of open spaces in our building. So this is just going, I can't stop it. <laughs> um, so the crisis can only be solved if we invert the present. Of course, Illich is writing this in 1970. The crisis can only be solved if we invert the present deep structure of tools. If we give people tools that guarantee the right to work with high independent efficiency, thus simultaneously eliminating the need for either slaves or masters, enhancing each person's range of freedom. So like this is, these projects, that's how our projects live. Um, you know, Recycle Cycles is the bike shop, 5,000 bikes, people bring their bikes to get, the, get their bikes fixed, 650 or so bikes are refurbished and sold. Um, uh, it's, you know, a completely independent operation within the working center. The, the people of Recycle Cycles, they, they, they have tremendous energy to serve the people of Kitchener, for, uh, to serve the bikes of the people of Kitchener. And, and it's, you know, 50 volunteers and two or three staff, and they manage themselves. And it's work, and the working center creates the infrastructure. They don't pay rent. You know, we look after their bookkeeping. We look after their, um, when they need to buy tools or they need, um, they need to buy stuff so they can sell it, so they can earn some income. And so all these community tools, and again, there's 35 projects, um, look to the central working center for all kinds of that help, uh, but make it work. Well, anyways, I'm getting lost in the stuff. So supportive housing, you know, there's an example of an old building. Um, you know, we fixed, we didn't do a great job on this one, but, but you know, we did our best. <laughs> uh, the working center in downtown Kitchener, we're spread out. So we're, you know, we have one side over here and then um, in the middle is kind of our core. And then on the other side, and, and we do all kinds of downtown street outreach around homeless work. And um, it really helps to be, um, to have the downtown surrounded. Um, these are these are better examples of buildings that we fixed up. That's uh, King Street style. And then there's this uh, stuff at 97 Victoria, which uh, I think the next slide kind of shows there's a thrift store and then St. John's Kitchen, which serves a free meal for 300 people, hospitality house for homeless people uh, uh, who are very ill, uh, St. John's Clinic and psychiatric outreach work. Um, you know, three psychiatric outreach nurses plus social worker and um, uh, a nurse practitioner and about three volunteer doctors, uh, community dental, uh, downtown street outreach workers, another thing serving about a thousand individuals. Um, so that's, that's another part of the work that integrates a holistic kind of way and of, and of work, the work of care. Um, of serving the homeless in a, in a decent way with good sites, um, good, good kind of approaches, but um, really important kinds of services that don't have to be administrated like a charity, but 
Um, and so, for example, St. John's Kitchen, we describe it as a place that, that um, sur distributes surplus food. We've never called it, um, you know, something that's not about that our society has surplus food. We are involving the people of St. John's Kitchen, the patrons, the people who come for a meal in the reproduction of that, of that surplus food and then the serving of it. So that's, that has meant that we don't get government money to do that, but it also means that we don't ask any questions. It's for anyone. So the model of care becomes a model of openness, of generosity, of abundance. And again, we've been doing that for 34 years and um, you know, 300 people every day, and it's a community that, that builds, and it's very possible to do. Pictures of St. John's. Um, so there's a couple things I just wanted to bring up. Um, oh, shoot. <laughs> this thing is on, on, on automatic, obviously. Um, ecological works of mercy. We've just been playing around with these kinds of ideas. Share our independence. I think that was cultivate something. <laughs> um, life is for loving, not amassing possessions. We do these kind of things just to to describe, know your place, know your community. Um, we do these kinds of things to inspire within our culture a different way of thinking. Use tools, yeah, this is good. I think that's, I think there's one more. Okay, so that's, so that's, that's allowed the Working Center to um, kind of have a, a different way of thinking about things. The whole person is a creative person that explores and animates the universe out of an inner sense of freedom. So then, the uh, virtues. Um, those are, these are the virtues for us. Uh, work. Is it going to stop? <laughs> yeah, it is. Thank goodness. Uh, work as gift, living simply, serving others, uh, rejecting status. Um, those are, you know, very basic philosophical um, kind of positions. They're philosophical because they come from the philosophy of personalism, which is, you know, work as gift, live simply, serve others, reject status. These are things you can do from the heart. But then you have to go out into community. And that's building communities the is the fourth one, fifth one, and then creating community tools. That's our virtue. It's a virtue of the organization that uh, it's so important not to... Um, uh, make ourselves, um, you know, have more power within the organization, like to have more money, to accumulate money for the sake of the organization. It's about um, accumulating resources so that we can create more community tools which give people access to tools, which allows people who are left out of the labor market to, to become enlivened, to, to fulfill for themselves the skills and abilities that they have to serve others and community. And I think, oh, so sorry, but we won't go through all these. They're, they're very nice. Actually, that's a good one too. Go back, go back. Um, creating community tools. Striving to put productive tools into the hands of people and developing culture around sharing and cooperation. And now it's going. And we have a book about that called Transition to Common Work, uh, Building Community at the Working Center. Make sure that those are off now. Yeah. I don't am I I have no idea about time. <laughs> I can keep talking. You allow me to keep talking? <laughs> Yes, I need two fingers. <coughs> Thank you so much, Joe, for sharing with us what is happening just here yeah. in, the, in, in this place. I'm sure there will be lots of questions about how you've managed to do all this, and I see lots of connections between the two presentations. I'm sure there will be many questions from the audience, so please write them on your pieces of paper and give them to Vijay and others who are collecting them. And what we'll do is sit uh, here and just have a bit of a discussion about this. So the, the first thing that I want to ask, having not known in advance at all what, what <laughs> this was going to be like, 
but I see so many points of connection. And I guess maybe the first thing we could do is ask you each to comment on the other person's yeah. talk and what connections you see. Yeah. So Becky, do you want to go first? Well, obviously, I think this is a, I mean, Joel started by saying this, that the working center is an example of what I said as um, kind yeah. of common in practices. And I think like some of the, the very, the, the virtues that you mentioned and some of the principles and the, and the, and the practices that you've, you've implemented are actually, for me, care. This kind of the, the implementation of an equal pay scale, for instance, is kind mm. of is recognizing interdependence of the community that produce and reproduce the working, working center and kind of making a decision intentionally, saying that we're not going to pay people according to some kind of an imposed measure of productivity, but we're going to recognize our interdependence and our uh, and being in common, and we're going to make an ethical decision to pay equally. And like how you share work and what kind of work you do. You were telling me, he was telling me <laughs> before, I knew what he was going to <laughs> talk about. <laughs> like that, this kind of, this collective and democratic decision making. And that it, it does take social relationships and it does reproduce social relationships. I think that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the part. It's, do, it's, it's not only a one way thing. It's not that we, the quality of our social relationships only determines the kind of practices we come up with. But as we participate in kind of these forms of care, radical care, we become caring subjects. We become different subjects. So there is no essence to be kind of um, recovered or there's no essence of self-interest. So I think mm -hmm. this is the, that it, it survived for 35 years is, is, its, is its kind of. It's amazing. Um, yeah. And that's, I think th uh, the point I wrote, especially down is uh, recognizing oneself <laughs> as a process of becoming. And, um, and so that, I think that's true for um, um, people who come work at the working center. It's a process of becoming uh, because you're, um, you're becoming less like, say, the capitalist you were trained in school <laughs> and to become something as a social being. And you know, what does that social being look like? And, uh, or how does it uh, manifest itself? And it really, it changes. And so then um, the idea of, I, one of the things I forgot to say was uh, the idea that, um, you know, if you want to do something, then you should have happy children. You know, uh, one way of changing the world is by having happy children. Well, you actually, ha the working center is a really happy place to hang around. I don't think I would have hung around <laughs> for that long if it wasn't happy. And uh, we, there's a, a professor who's very important to the working center. Um, who you say, I come to the working center to get away from the university because there's too many dour, dour faced people. <laughs> and I like to come to the working center where people are happy. <laughs> yeah, and doing things yeah. that, that have yeah. practical implications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> I, I, I would like to ask you, thank, thank you both for that. Do you, do you have any comments on, uh, well, on Beggy's? Well, oh yeah, I yeah. guess I. I, I summarize it, I'm sorry, about the process of becoming. Yeah. Um, but the philosophy that, that you were sharing is the philosophy that we, I think tangentially the working center has been working through. So most of what you're saying is, yeah, that, those are the ideas. We came to those ideas um, mostly uh, uh, through um, um, Ivan Illich and Wendell Berry, Small is Beautiful. And I sounded maybe you came through more of a Marxist kind of lens, and um, but I, I think all uh, but the Wendell Berries and uh, Ivan Illiches were reading the Marxists to understand their their point too. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a lot, yeah, a lot of commonalities in the in this in this theoretical history and yeah. and what you're doing to yeah. apply it. Oh, Polanyi probably would be another one yeah. that we didn't get to talk about. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask about the last, the la one of the last things you said was about um, respecting indigenous traditions, or I don't mm -hmm. remember the language yeah. exi exactly, but at this conference we've been talking a lot about um, what you could call uh, an indigenous collective sense of uh, the way to, the way a society can be based in relationships. And um, <coughs> of course we, 
you know, Kitchener is a pretty colonial name. <laughs> <laughs> can say and that again. And uh, uh, I, I, I wanted to ask more about how I it is that you are respecting Indigenous traditions in the, in the work of the Working Center. I'm not trying uh, to put you on yeah, the spot. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> something, no, we're working on it. Um, in a, there's a, there's a natural way where um, the many, um, say, marginalized indigenous people in Kitchener are integral to the working center. And so for, and the reason I think that's been true is because they've seen in the way the structures feel to them to be closer to their culture. So, mm. so in that way, that's, that has, that's been true for us. Now we're trying to understand how to do that structure more structurally. And um, uh, we have a bunch of projects on the go that, that are teaching us. And so that's, and so we're, we're moving more in that direction. That's great. Can um, you want to talk more about this um, project or? Yeah, well, um, a personal project is re, uh, you know, re rethinking Queen Street history from an indigenous perspective, mm -hmm. which um, if there's a university student who uh, likes writing history and wants to do that interpretation, that's what I'm looking for someone who would help us because we've kind of understood the Queen Street history, but, but that history, you know, leaves out the indigenous people. And um, I, but there's all kinds of ways to bring that back. And I, and I feel like we have enough that we could turn it into something. And this would be reinterpreting at um, in a way that hasn't been done in Canada very often. Mm -hmm. But um, we're working on an indigenous healing lodge, and um, and it's an you know it's some it's again marginalized indigenous people who are recreating who are creating this idea and using the infrastructure just the same kind of decentralized project. You're running the project. We we have the resources. We have we can do the grant writing. But you, you decide, we have nothing to do with what will happen. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm seeing some of these questions from the audience that uh, relate to this. So I'm going to go with those. And there are questions also for you, Thing. So <laughs> hang tight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> here's two more. Um, one is, how do you navigate challenges of oral culture and, and communication barriers with such an elaborate and expansive organization? That's, um, again, it's... Actually, it's much easier than you'd think because um, the, oral, the oral culture teaches uh, people to listen at the grassroots. So the projects are where we experience people and it's in the projects that people talk to each other. So we, we've always been against um, um, you know, surveys to see how people feel. Like That's such nonsense because how people feel happen when they're s working around a table or they're, they're fixing a bike together. And that's where the communication happens. So in fact, we have high communication at the grassroots and that's where we want it. Mm -hmm. And it's inclusive to, yeah. to make it more oral because then you're not excluding people who can't write or read or, right. or who for whom English is not their first language. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some, there are other models, a lot of people are very curious about, you know, sort of the, <laughs> yeah. how does this actually work? Do you, do you think people self-select? There's a book the you can center? read. They can read the book. <laughs> <laughs> there's questions about the budget and where the money comes from. And um, I can just answer that quickly. Okay. Uh, 50, because it's easy to just say, 50% of the working center comes from government money, but 35% is social enterprise and 15% uh, is donations. Uh, so it's a nice combination but government doesn't pay for maybe like three or four of the projects which maybe are like lo like you know a psychiatric outreach project or the hospitality house but we do most of the other stuff and the employment work but so we we've, we've we've marginalized the state to where it should be <laughs> <laughs> and, and where can we get your book um, the Working Center sells it online. Okay. Um, it's a Laurier, Wilfrid Laurier Press. Okay. So, I mean, chapters or whatever. Oh, yeah? You know. Around oh yeah. here? And around here? Like? Well, the Working Center Cafe. Okay. Is um, that open tonight? No. Tomorrow? No. <laughs> so, online. You can <laughs> get it anywhere online. Okay. Yeah, because people have uh, lives and families. Yeah. So, why should they be there on Saturday night, yeah. right? 
Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Okay, I have one. We're a we're a work we're a day operation. So that's so we've never relied on like say church volunteers or things like that. It's the idea is that we've relied on the people who are left out of the labor market to be part of the life of the working center. And we give lots of services back, like free meals and um, and produce and um, bikes and and computer recycling, uh, you know, fixing people's computers, like things people need, not to mention housing. Mm -hmm. So just one more for you. How can your model be transferred to society with respect to mobilizing large groups of community members to act together to restore our biosphere? Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> sure. sure. Um, well, we try hard to replicate. We, I think in southern Ontario, there's a lot of interest. I bet you there's absolutely no knowledge of it in Montreal outside of maybe Gregory Baum before he died. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we kind of, around... Ontario, Southern Ontario, we're a little bit known. Um, we don't really have much resources to go much beyond that. We run something called the Summer Institute that teaches our thing. It's a three-day institute. And it's we found that to be a good way, you know, f 15 people just kind of showing our way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So we, we do a fair bit. Of, uh, Diploma in Local Democracy is, is another one of our projects. Isaiah and I were just talking about a rethinking economics kind of um, teaching model at the community level. Mm -hmm. yeah, so and there are related yeah. um, organizations in other cities. Oh, Detroit sure. And, and, and yeah. in Montreal, there are yeah, organizations. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, we had some Buffalo. good conversations with the people from Detroit. Yeah. Really good time with them. Yeah, yeah. So I would you say that you're part of a movement? Yeah, we're, yeah, we are. We're not, we're not. We're not out there. The working center is very focused on trying to do. We're we're really busy, trying to it's keep all locally, that together. Yes. Right? So okay. it's really hard to link widely. But okay. we're always happy for ambassadors. Right. Okay. We're gonna. I. This is gonna connect up. Okay. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Nancy Fulbright. I think this is mostly for you, but you can uh, can answer okay. too. I no, don't know. Nancy, <laughs> here for Nancy a Fulbright, who is a feminist economist points to some implicit uh, paradoxes in care work, such that the only way to preserve its value is not to pay for it. Hmm. What are the challenges and opportunities for building a degrowth future without commodifying labor? Wow. Okay. There you go. Um, so, yeah, Nancy Fulbright is one of the feminist uh, economists who've done a lot of work on, on, on care work. And actually, she was one of the people I studied with when I was doing my, my PhD. So um, <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't think she might like what I'm going to say right now. But um, she's an economist. She is an economist. <laughs> so are you, Annie. Anyway. Uh. <laughs> so, um, so am I. So, um, <laughs> so Nancy's point is more, it's kind of the point that I started with, right? So that the quality of care understood in a more narrow sense of providing for the needs of, of others depends on kind of this altruistic feeling that like people do give, provide better care when they actually feel like giving it. And um, she was kind of pointing out this paradox that because people kind of do it out of this kind of innate feeling, they don't require a lot of monetary compensation. And because they're not paid well, a lot of care workers, then there we have kind of this undersupply of care. So there's this paradox that care is better done when it's not paid. Because when you don't pay it enough, only the people who will actually genuinely care for will do it. So you kind of, mm -hmm. kind of weed out the, the, the people who are only doing it for money, basically. But then you kind of exploit the care workers a lot and you kind of end up with this paradoxical situation. Either you have high quality care that is undersupplied or low quality care that is kind of adequately supplied in yeah. a way. So she kind of, she's, she's a great, great thinker and I think it's a really kind of politically also very important point that she's making that we need to pay our care workers adequately and like in order to get out of this paradox and she was calling for social policy basically but i mean i think like what i was trying to do is kind of get out of this understanding of care especially if you're going to 
understand care as a kind of a principle, as a fundamental principle of organizing our economies differently. Um, but if we're going to talk about kind of care work in this narrow sense, I especially in a degrowth or kind of a transition future, um, what I argue and what kind of some other feminists and, and kind of what, for instance, some of the degrowth feminists, but also kind of Silvia Federici and like the, the kind of Marxist feminists in her reign uh, argue is more towards common care work. Right. Where it's not, where it's both kind of done, it's both accessed equally, but it's also produced collectively and equally so that we kind of move beyond this gender binary and like do it kind of in a gender egalitarian way but also make sure that this care work can be accessed by everyone in a degrowth society. So I think there is a, there is a way to not commodify it, but also not um, romanticize it. So there is a way between like love and money in kind of Nancy's term. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but one way is to make it possible for people to provide care in an unpaid way for people that they do want to provide it of to. Of course. Instead of making it uh, impossible for them to do that. Of Especially course. low in, you know, if people are low income, they have to be working somewhere and put their kids in daycare yes. because they can't, you know, or, or y you know, like it, it becomes impossible. So it's about um, something that Joe and I were talking about before this also, a base, a, 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 a sort of a floor uh, which allows people to actually live the way they want to live mm -hmm. and make choices about how to use their labor or if yeah. you might not even call it labor, their care, their yeah. care work, right? Yeah. I guess, I mean, it also depends like whether we are, because a lot of the kind of autonomous Marxists or like social reproduction feminists like mm -hmm. Silvia Federici, the question isn't only that um, care work or kind of the broader social reproductive work is supplied or by whom it is supplied, or partly that, but that we revolutionize that field. So we kind of change the nature of supplying care work. Yeah. That only through that, only through organizing the, the kind of provision of, of social reproduction or care work in a more egalitarian way and in a more feminist way, in a more kind of also socialist way. Intersectional way. Intersectional way. That's the mm. only way we can transform capitalism because like social reproduction or the field of care is not only kind of impo is not only kind of subject to laws of capitalism, but it's like it's a field of social change and it's a field of struggle in itself. So I think there are two kind of maybe analytically different questions like whether like how do we ensure the kind of provision of kind of adequate quality accessible care, but also how do we organize that kind of field of care work. Mm -hmm. And it could be that providing those basic minimum needs for people allows you to get away from not only the gender binary, but also it allows you to expand care to include community gardening and bicycle repair and you know refitting old bu buildings for housing and providing services that you're able to do uh, like being a dentist um, for a few hours a week uh, in an unpaid way to people who really need it exactly. because you want to be contributing exactly. to community right mm -hmm. um, it's it, it, not yep. that the dentists need the basic income but the <laughs> you know <laughs> some of those bike repair guys may yes, right for sure because they're probably working as couriers sure. or something elsewise uh, yeah well, well, I mean, th th the dentist might not need the basic income, but then if the, bi the dentist has the basic income and kind of has an option to, sh to choose how many hours to work, then would not have to work as much and then could like contribute more to, to care. To community, yeah. to care, exactly. to that right. broad yeah. care. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I've always argued that the, the people that need the basic income are the people who don't have access to work. And I'd rather start with that group and, and in fact, much of that is already in place with um, social, as long as uh, the state and in Ontario, uh, up to now they have, um, they've broadened the concept of, of, um, of assistance, or they have up to now. It's probably going to be cut back a bit, but, um, but it's been fairly broad. Say Waterloo Region, 19,000 people are on some kind of social assistance. And, what um, percentage of the population is that? Do you know? 19, it would be out of 500,000. Okay, so 
do the percentage. That's not that high. Yeah. That's what, 1%? Yeah, <laughs> it's not much. Yeah. It's not high. Um, yeah. Whatever. Um, anyways, but that's, a, that's the group most marginalized, yeah. most uh, lacking in things. And the ability for that group to, say, earn 600 bucks, which most of them would, not all, but a good percentage would be able to earn if they were given the freedom. In fact, many of them do earn, they just aren't able to actually report it. And, and being able to free those individuals to, be, to, um, to earn income in, in creative ways um, would go a long way to giving people um, a, a stronger base. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So anyways, I just think that that's an easier way to get to basic income than trying to get everybody. Is, is tar yeah, starting slow and then you can build it up. Start with the people who really yeah. need it. Because the child tax benefit is tremendously helpful for families and individuals with children. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's very substantial. So what you're getting into is policies that make it possible for this kind of, an, of a commoning social transition yeah. to take place. Oh, well, you know, I've, uh, you know, we have 500 volunteers. Many of our people who are left out of the labor market, they find joy and, um, and the ability to use their skills and abilities um, through this structure. And, um, yeah. and they are commoning. Like they're, I think that's the language. They are, and they're, they're doing it from their freedom. And, um, and so that's, that's a, you know, if you put a little bit of income with that, then all of a sudden you have a degrowth kind of um, approach to society, yeah. I think. And it's freeing. Mm -hmm. as yeah, as and it's an freeing about, yeah. and happy. So happy that feeds yeah. very well into this last question I have from the audience. <laughs> as a young-ish person making a career switch, the environmental movement seems full of the same ladder climbing mentality as elsewhere. What's your advice wow. for starting a career without getting into the rat race? <laughs> Bengi, you go first. <laughs> 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 um, starting a career without getting into the rat race. I don't know what it, like the career environmental movement is like what what it is actually but yeah I can see that it, it's probably the same ladder climbing I I don't know um, but probably like constructing or finding a space for making a livelihood that is less competitive or like that embodies and, and practices different values, but I'm not sure if like, this is too vague and too kind of, I don't know it's what hard. to say. In it's a hard because we haven't been acting long enough to make those, pol put those policies in place so people have the freedom to make those choices. Yeah. Okay. You know, and the f we're, we're faced with a political situation that is kind of going the other direction, yep. right? It's yep. undermining people's ability, taking away s funding for childcare and <laughs> and, and, yeah. those, and those basic income type, you know, the basic income was just a symptom yeah. of, but as you're saying, it was an inefficient perhaps way to do it. But even the, l the more efficient ways to provide that floor are, mm, let's say, not top priorities for, no. for many They never will, or they won't be for a while. They won't, won't be for a while. <laughs> but I, I, I would like, I think, um, I mean, I would say that for Stephanie and I, uh, that's, that was the question we had in 1982, it's the same question. I think, you know, you can look, at, um, the organizational structure hasn't changed, it hasn't changed really a lot in these 37 years, in that, you know, a lot of structure is about power, a lot of structure is about money, and, and um, these, these structures really try and suck you into that, and you have to play the game. And, um, and really, I think, con the work, working center consciously tried to create something that was different, and um, but the the price is that say my salary is forty thousand. Um, the joy is that um, the working center produces um, all kinds of stuff for our community, and it, and it is real joy. Um, but um, I think that the trade off is way better. I have a lot of fun at work. I have a lot of fun in our meetings because we're, we work as equals um, and we've created a, a sense of working as equals to serve community. And so 
to me, that's how you get around that, your question. Well, like making that, like conscious, that. <laughs> making that conscious choice, if you want. I mean, that's a choice that an individual can make. And one choice is to find organizations where you can actually do that. It will cost you, but it'll be worth it. Mm -hmm. yeah, be you can find uh, them or you can start them. What's that? You, you can, can find them or oh, you can start oh, them. Oh, start them, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. <laughs> yeah. I think you can. <laughs> all right, well, maybe that's a good place to end. I think that uh, our time is just about up. But thank you all. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you.